Hello and welcome to this webinar on fires, mudslides, earthquakes, shootings, promoting personal and community resiliency after mass trauma. We have Dr. Patricia Haynes here today and she will be presenting. She is an associate professor here at the University of Arizona's Mel and Enid Zuckerman College of Public Health. She is also a licensed clinical psychologist and behavioral sleep medicine specialist with expertise in cognitive behavioral therapies for PTSD, depression, and insomnia. She has a well-established relationship with the Tucson Fire Department, providing services to fire service members and assisting in the establishment of behavioral health policies and programs designed to foster firefighter mental health and stress resiliency. This webinar is brought to you jointly by the WRPHTC, that's the Western Region Public Health Training Center, and the Southwest Telehealth Resource Center. It will be recorded and made available on both websites. Next. Okay. <clears throat> okay, and here we have a map, in case you're not familiar with the Regional Public Health Training Center program, we are one of 10 public health training centers funded by HRSA. And if you're not familiar with your public health training center, you can Google search to find out more because we do provide free trainings for the public health workforce. Okay, next. <laughs> so before we start, we have a couple tips and notes. If you could mute your phone or computer microphone, that would be great. We have time reserved at the end of the session for question and answers. If you have any questions, you can use the Q&A function of Zoom to type those in and we will take them at the end. We also have a post webinar survey at the end and I think you'll go directly to that. Um, you will wanna fill that out if you are looking for continuing education credits. And again, we are being recorded. This will be archived on our website. So we did get approval for continuing education credits for CHES and for CNEs provided by the College of Nursing here at University of Arizona. The next slide. There's some information here for those of you searching for CNEs. The learning outcomes are the same as those of the webinar, so I'm gonna let Dr. Haynes introduce those. <clears throat> next. And to disclose any relevant financial relationships. We are provi provided um, funding from HRSA. And the NIH, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And for nursing education units, you can um, visit the cne.nursing.arizona.edu at the end to fill out the evaluation form you'll see CPE evaluation link on the right-hand side of that website, and you must be present for the full duration of this webinar to do so. Okay, and now to Dr. Haynes. Okay, great. So it is a pleasure to speak um, here with you today. Um, so um, in terms of the relevant goals of what I'll be talking about, um, the first thing is identifying five essential elements of short-term mass trauma intervention. And I just want to say that it's not a fix of considering mass trauma. I'll also be talking about several evidence-based approaches to the promotion of resiliency um, and very much on an individual level. But I also hope to touch base on the community level and see if we can talk about formulating some ideas of ways to promote connectedness and hope within your community, two key essential ingredients um, in terms of trauma intervention. And so without further ado, go ahead and uh, continue to advance. Um, I just wanna let you know that um, my uh, research specialty is in the area of sleep and trauma, um, but I, a lot of uh, what I'll be presenting here today um, is within the context of the tragedy in Tucson that happened in January, on January 8, 2011. There was a mass shooting at uh, Safeway. It was a Congress on your corner of event and it received a lot of immediate attention, um, largely because um, 
uh, it was uh, uh, our Congresswoman Gabrielle Gifford was shot. And uh, in that event, 19 people total were shot and uh, six were killed. And um, it was, like I said, it received a lot of uh, media attention. It was a, it was a major tragedy in, in our community. And um, this is a, a picture of what our University Medical Center looked like at that time. Um, this was, uh, um, at that time I was, uh, and I still am affiliated with the Department of Psychiatry. So my role in that um, was to train mental health providers in our department on how to respond to trauma. And um, I also uh, participated in um, emergency room evaluations as well as saw several survivors of the trauma. So, um, so yeah. So throughout the talk, I'll be talking a little bit about those experiences um, as well. So because we started the talk off in terms of this experience and part of the title of the talk was about mass shootings, I thought I'd just uh, give a little bit of context for the four shootings um, uh, over in uh, the United States. So just a quick look, you can see data from the FBI show that over time, which is the X axis from 2000 to 2017, there's been an increase in active shooter incidents in the United States. Um, and uh, one thing that I think thought was particularly compelling in, in looking at where we're at in terms of the, you know, there's a lot of different ways of breaking apart data, but that despite having less than 5% of our global population, the US actually has 31% of the global public mass shooters. So we tend to um, overrepresent um, these types of incidents occurring in the United States. This one study supports that. And then if we look at the number of casualties per year, you can see that, that those are, are largely rising as well, and especially last year with our <coughs> Las Vegas uh, shooting incident. Um, we also have seen, and this is largely due to uh, climate-related things, that there are increases in natural disasters as well. Um, so if to orient you to the slide, the, the uh, y-axis is representing the number of disasters and you can see that as we um, go, and, and part of this may in fact be due to reporting a little bit, but as we look at specifically across the last two decades, we can see that overall there's an increase in natural disasters related that are hydrometeorologic, which means that they're climate related. Um, so that includes floodings, hurricanes, things that can be attributed to you know, wildfires um, as compared to geophysical disasters, which are relatively constant, and that would be things such as earthquakes. Um, and then you can also see that the economic damage from, from these types of disasters is rising as well. Um, if we talk about fires and mudslides, which is very um, cognizant for California right now in the Western United States, we can see that um, as compared to the 1990s in the 2000s, we've had two times the number of areas burnt by wildfires um, in terms of acreage. Um, so that is increasing as well, and that's consistent with that climate-related data I showed before. And we actually have very little data on mudslides, and we don't keep a mass data set and, and, um, on landslides specifically in our country, but we know that they are a common um, and frequent problem, especially after wildfires because of the erosion issues that occur with that. So what is the public health relevance to this talk? And I think, I, mean, I think we can all agree there's a public health relevance, but there's a lot of different ways of looking at it. So one, the first thing is the primary prevention efforts. How can we stop mass disasters? And so I think a lot of this relates from a public health perspective of our One Health initiatives and ways that we can slow and stop climate change and these types of things from occurring. Um, there's a whole separate body, I feel, that talks a lot about preparedness. So when mass disasters are happening, how can we ensure that individuals are ready and prepared to react? Um, what I'll be talking today here more is about secondary prevention. When disasters occur, how can we help communities recover? And I just um, want to inform everybody that FEMA actually has an excellent national disaster recovery framework, including toolkits in the area of community planning and capacity building. Um, and then frames across all spectrums, including economic recovery, housing recovery, infrastructure, and natural cultural. Um, much of what I'll be talking about today is within the context of health and social services recovery. Um, um, yeah. <clears throat> so how do events reach traumatic proportions for individuals? Um, one way to think about this is, is as a supply-demand situation. The, the demands of the situation are overwhelming from a physical perspective, 
from the psychological and even from social, and it outstrips the resources or the supply of what individuals can handle. And I'd say individuals, but that's also community and coping resources as well. Um, they also reach traumatic proportion when individuals have to be relocated. There's a loss of safety or basic needs are no longer being met. And, and then it can reach it when, when even if safety and basic needs are there, when it has damaging effects on the way that people think about, about meaning and order um, and justice. Common reactions to trauma. So there's a lot of different ways that people react to trauma, and we'll be talking a little bit about what's normal um, within the context of, of trauma. But I think a good general guideline is that there are four basic categories or areas where people have, um, like, I don't know if I want to say symptoms, but typical reactions that, that, that coalesce. So um, after people are exposed to trauma, the first area would be when they have reactions or reminders of those. So they might have unwanted memories or dreams, um, a pounding heart, or they're sweating when they're reminded. And so sometimes when people have these reactions, they get reactions in a second symptom or second cluster, which is avoidance. Sometimes people don't want to have those memories, so they'll avoid things that remind them of the memories or they'll avoid places or conversations that are reminders. <clears throat> so for instance, after the Gabrielle Giffords incidents, one of the things that people often did would be you know, not go to a grocery store, go to a grocery store at a time of night that was very, like, um, very few people were there, so at night. Um, emotional reactions and negative thoughts. So um, here we're seeing symptoms, people feeling hopeless or sad. You know, but one of the things I really want to underscore is that there's a lot of variability when it comes to emotional reactions. Some people feel nothing at all. <clears throat> um, there's also negative thoughts. So people might have a sense of self-blame or feel, have negative views about how the world works or people in the world that can oftentimes become stereotyped or very like all or nothing thoughts. And then lastly, when people are exposed to trauma, it's very normal for them to have symptoms of hyperarousal or physical arousal. And I, the way I, I commonly talk about this with my patients is it's sort of like your body is on constant red alert. And so it's really hard to get back to green. So feeling on guard, being irritable or overreactive and, and having trouble sleeping are all very common after trauma. <clears throat> Uh, one thing I'd like to underscore, although these are common and frequent symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, trauma exposure does not mean that people are going to be developing PTSD. In fact, most people who experience trauma do not develop PTSD. Um, they might have some of the symptoms, but, but not. Um, so because of that, um, I think there's this outlying idea that if we can get um, people treatment or early intervention, then we can prevent these PTSD from occurring. But actually, studies do not support that early psychological intervention leads to better mental health outcomes. In fact, some research says that if we go in and provide a form of intervention or treatment in the early aftermath of an event related to trauma, we make people talk about it, or we have people debrief or go, you know, maybe people that aren't ready to or don't want to, that it can actually increase PTSD. Um, so I really want to underscore that um, we don't want to assume that everyone's traumatized just because they've been through tragedy um, and that individual variability really is a guiding factor. People should have control over how they want to cope and how they want to, um, how they want to reorganize their world. So um, it's really important to, to use that as a guiding factor. And then the last thing is that oftentimes people who look very resilient sometimes still do need support. So we, we need to be very careful about our assumptions in that short-term aftermath. Um, and just to underscore that, I always like to present data. And one of the things I think is somewhat surprising for people is that, as a reminder, the PTSD diagnosis requires at least 30 days. And PTSD is not necessarily the most common negative mental health outcome after trauma. So one study looked at um, individuals who developed depression versus PTSD after 9-11. And so just to kind of orient you to the slide, um, the yellow represents um, people who developed um, a 9-11 related PTSD. And the purple represent um, people who developed um, major depressive disorder episode after 9-11. 
And you can see that in almost every category of trauma associated with 9-11, whether it's a close associate or being directly endangered or any trauma exposure, you can see that actually depression was a more frequent outcome than post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, the only exception to that was being an eyewitness. And, um, but I, I just bring this up because I think that we hear a lot in the media and we need to be really clear about our assumptions of, of stress and depression and, and, and stressor-related disorders. So <clears throat> now that we understand the problem a little bit more and also the natural response after trauma a little bit more, um, what, do, what, what can we do um, in, in the face of these types of things? How can we intervene if we need to be really careful about psychological intervention? So say there are five essential elements and all of these come from a excellent review paper by Hopfall and colleagues. It's considered a classic in the field from 2007 and it was actually named one of the most influential papers in psychiatry. So I definitely encourage people to check it out. Um, and the five items that we'll be going over today are promoting a sense of safety, promoting calming, promoting a sense of self and collective efficacy or that ability to feel like, you know, your actions make a difference, promoting connectedness, and then finally hope, which is forward thinking. And we'll talk, be talking more about each of those um, in more detail. Okay, and but before we get into them, I just really want to underscore um, some IASC guidelines. This is the Interagency Standing Committee um, through the United Nations for mental health and psychosocial support in emergency settings. And, and the, this is um, considered the intervention pyramid. And it actually, I think, very much models Maslow's hierarchy of need. You have heard of that, that, um, that hierarchy of needs. And it really underscores the fact that before we get into talking about mental health care by mental health specialists, we really the first thing we have to do is to really um, consider um, basic services and security. And that's why I think part of it, the safety is such a key piece. So people need to have access to food and water and shelter in a way that predicts dignity before we start talking a little bit more about, about um, like basic mental health care. Okay, so at the bottom of that guideline is really the, the necessity of safety. Um, after that, in terms of like which interventions we administer, um, once people feel like they've protected those social services with dignity, that's when we talk about activating social support networks, you know, finding communal and traditional supports, and then moving up to basic mental health care by primary care doctors or um, public health workers. And then finally at the top is that specialized services or the mental health care by mental health specialists. Okay, so underscoring that bottom level of the pyramid, which is promoting the sense of safety, um, what do we mean by safety? So safety is food, shelter, water at a basic need and um, making sure that people have what they need, those basic essential needs to live. The other thing I wanna talk about in terms of mass tragedy is having safe spaces. So um, children need to play, they need a place where they, they're not walking on uneven surfaces or there's glass. They need a safe space where they can congregate and where meetings can happen as well. So that's another community reaction is finding those safe spaces. Oftentimes when, when um, really, when there's chaotic, we forget about things like medications or essential aids for vulnerable individuals. Maybe an elderly person needs a cane or there's eyeglasses that are missing. So one of the, the, the major things that we need to remember is really our vulnerable subgroups and how to ensure safety um, across all of that, which also includes essential aids. Now, what about safety from a psychological perception? Well, <clears throat> several studies have shown that there is a strong dose response relationship between media exposure and later development of distress. So, um, so what that means is that we really need to be careful about um, exposure to media, especially media that very much pr promotes like hyperbolic or exaggerated or promotes threat perception, like, hey, we need to, um, we need to be really careful here. So, and, and I, I would say that goes hand in hand with um, talking about horror stories, like, oh, this is bad, but you should have heard this other thing was really bad, kind of one upping um, impact of um, other things that have occurred or even rumors. So an alternative to this um, for relative communities is talking about resiliency or ways that the community is coming together to address some of these problems 
rather than media exposure. And I'm sure that, that you know, at some point in time, we've had so many, we've talked a lot about this tragedy in our country. It can get really easy to get stuck on an endless loop of um, media event after media event, and always hoping for new information or something that will, um, something that will help us make sense of the event. But in reality, a lot of times it's spinning and, um, and for survivors that is not, um, and it involves waiting, which is not um, particularly useful in that moment. So an alternative way to decrease threat perception is really to give information and prioritize information that's vital to people. And uh, from the data that we know, that includes um, information about family members. <clears throat> now, what about individuals who are not stabilized? So what that means is people who might be dissociated or having very strong and um, emotional reactions that, that indicate that they're overwhelmed or even that they're, they're could be going into signs of shock. Um, <clears throat> so in those instances, it can really behoove um, community workers and others to try to, I and mean, first of all, we have to allow individuals to have their reactions, but, but making sure that they know you're available in case it's need. So that calm, quiet, present response, um, I think emotionally overwhelmed survivors can be oriented to the present and to what's happening around them and um, what they can do in that moment. There's also techniques called grounding, which um, orient individuals to um, to sensory um, perceptions, like, hey, I, I notice this noise or I see this color. And these types of um, interventions can help stabilize people so that they can get to a place, um, they can get to that place of safety. And I'll just say that we could, you know, we could do uh, full webinars on each of these um, and that, that psychological first aid, which is um, a large part of this presentation, is um, discussing that intervention is a course that's actually available on the internet and um, you can get a certification in it and it provides a lot more information on this um, in detail as needed. Okay, what about grief? So what do you say to somebody and when they've gone through um, such awful things or they've lost so much of what is so important to them? Um, the thing to say, uh, and you can't ever really go wrong with empathy, which is, you know, you know I might not know how you feel, but I can tell that what you're experiencing is completely understandable and expectable. And, and that sadness, anger, loneliness, all of these are normal. So, so very much going back into that safe, um, normalizing response. Um, there are a couple of things I also, um, sometimes it's so awkward for us as helpers um, and we want to help and we don't know what to say. So it can get easy to relapse into platitudes, um, things like, um, that which doesn't kill us, us makes us stronger or everything happens for a reason or, you know, telling people you need to grieve or you need to relax. I would argue that those responses are not as helpful in that moment um, because they um, are really assigning a meaning or a value judgment um, or even telling people how they need to react. Um, so at this point in time, it's really important to allow people to have as much control as possible given that the event they went through was so uncontrollable. So um, things like it's okay to ask people if they have religious or spiritual needs. Um, and it is okay always to tell people that it can be helpful to talk to a counselor. You don't want to say you should talk to a counselor, but it can be helpful. So providing those nice linkages and being open and present is really um, a, a good key um, prospect to grief. And what, what about when you deliver bad news? Well, um, one of the key things, and, and it can be, I think it can be very scary to deliver bad news. Um, so one of the key things is not to rush and to allow people to have those strong um, reactions when they have them. And, and always to remember that, that um, people don't necessarily care. I mean, they, they, I don't want to say that they don't care, but how you feel as the, the deliverer of bad news is not as important. We really need to prioritize the feelings of, of the people receiving the news. So rather than knowing like, hey, I feel very sorry for you, but it's more of a, you know, I want, you know, let them try to see if you can give empathy to let them know that you're trying to understand how they feel. Okay. Um, the other thing I'd just like to mention is that if you can give um, news in groups, um, so social supports are around, and also so that children, um, children should never be shown morgue photos or should, you know, they should be um, 
they, sh they should not be left unaccompanied when receiving news. And, and on children, I just want to say they have a range of reactions. There's, um, um, it very much strongly depends upon developmental level. Um, so it's important not to push children to talk and to give um, age appropriate answers to questions. So we need to watch our vocabulary and make sure that we're being honest and not, um, not spinning information. With children, we also need to listen to their feelings without judgment. So sometimes children might not have a strong reaction as we would expect an adult would have, but that's, um, that's okay. So we just, but we need to understand that developmental levels present grief differently. And the big thing you, you kind of want to be watching out for is that if they feel like they did something wrong or they're at fault. So you just need to reassure children that, that they did not cause um, the loss. Okay, so that is the promotion of safety. Um, let's move into the second key essential ingredient, which is promotion of a calming. So I want to just talk, this is a, um, a slide by Patty Reese, where she kind of talks about what happens in natural recovery. So when people go through a traumatic event, they are often reminded of, of the event, like I said before. So, you know, somebody who um, might have been at that, that grocery store, Gabrielle Giffords, they drive by that store and they're reminded. And, and the, the natural reaction would then be to have a heart, increased arousal, increased heart rate, or some form of emotional response related to that reminder. And then what happens over time is that as people are exposed to reminders, they slowly decrease and also the emotional reactions to the reminder decrease. So it's a very normal response in natural recovery. Um, so it makes a lot of sense that the day after an event like that, you're going to be much more emotional than maybe 30 days after an event like that. So the reason calming is very important in natural recovering is that calming kind of helps this process a little bit by, by really addressing that piece on arousal. And how do, we, how do we calm? So calming, I would say the number one way to calm, it's not at the top of the slide, but the number one way is normalizing, is allowing people to know that, <clears throat> that whatever their reaction is experiencing is normal. And, and providing even some psychoeducational about natural reactions, like this makes a lot of sense. Just because you're having negative feelings, you know, about that, just because you're having negative memories about that grocery store doesn't mean that you're gonna develop PTSD. In fact, it's great to even explicitly state that to people, you know, because what can happen, um, if we go back to, you know, to that, that slide, um, is one of the things that can happen is people start noticing they're having these emotional reactions and they start paying more attention to their emotional reactions and that creates arousal. They're nervous that they're developing a problem because they're having memories. So by normalizing what we're doing is we're telling people that your reaction is completely normal and, and this is to be expected. Um, now, some people can also benefit from the additional, we talked about grounding and deep muscle relaxation or deep breathing. Um, other things that promote calming are activities, reminding people, like, you know, do you have hobbies? What, you know, what can you still do? Maybe you like to take walks that promotes positive emotional states. And then um, and we've already talked about, about media as news reports that give facts, right, versus um, news reports that might spin information or, or increase threat perception. Now, I just want to just briefly mention on some, some don'ts. There's the do's and don'ts of calming. And one activity um, there's a, um, that is no longer recommended is actually debriefing, um, critical incident stress debriefing. I know some people find it helpful, and I, and I, and I certainly know that there's, um, there is some controversy about it, that people have really lived by this. But, um, but in general, um, encouraging people right after an event to talk about it when people might not be ready or they want to go talk about it with a loved one versus an outside counselor, you know, people have their own ways to cope. So, so it might not be arousing to everybody, but it could be potentially arousing. So it's actually no longer recommended in the short-term aftermath. Now, what if somebody wants to talk about it to you? Absolutely no problem, right? If somebody wants to go over and what happened, as long as it's not going into the realm of therapy, at which time it's time to kind of consider getting that person bridged to a referral source. <clears throat> but, um, but the key thing is um, we have to use a lot of care um, when it comes to organized, structured events that are designed with all good intentions to, um, to help people, but in fact, might cause um, some problems because again, it's raising arousal. Um, and then uh, other things that are potentially arousing, um, which are 
uh, venting can be really, you know, I think about, um, you know, some of the disasters that have struck homes like um, hurricanes and fires. And it is, I can only imagine the frustration that people go through working with insurance and trying to figure out how to rebuild their lives. And so that can be potentially arousing too in that short term moment. Um, and then also um, uh, really watching activities that promote negative social states. So uh, drinking and, and other types of things at that point in time, I would say argue is not, not calming. What about from a community perspective? Well, there are numerous, um, you know, there is the possibility of using the media to help um, individuals um, find, find a bridge to resources for relaxation, sleep hygiene, and media. Um, and, and I just want to say that one of the, the good outreach campaigns ones are ones that normalize reactions. So they're avoiding using pathology terms like PTSD or depression or mental health disorders. And they're kind of providing the education I'm providing here, which is that, that um, all of this is normal. I do want to say that on a community level, um, and then specifically in natural disasters, the best predictors of later distress of developing PTSD and depression is that initial and secondary resource loss. So um, by that I mean like loss of home, loss of livelihood. So um, to a certain extent, a lot of our community level interventions are gonna be best predicted towards community things we can do to rebuild. And that over time is gonna be quite a bit of what helps protect us from individual level mental health related factors. I love this quote by Helen Keller, although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the ever overcoming of it. <clears throat> and the reason I love it is because it strongly speaks to this concept of self-efficacy. So what exactly is self-efficacy? It's the beliefs that your actions can lead to generally positive out outcomes. So I can cope with this, I can do this. And um, how do we develop a sense of self-efficacy? Well, and I'll say this is especially hard when it comes to mass trauma because most of us are very inexperienced with this. These, are, these can be rare events. Um, so a lot of times, um, you know, we develop self-efficacy judgments based on our past experiences. And if we've never been through past trauma, it's really hard to know that we'll be able to cope with it in the future. Okay, but um, our data do support that people like, for instance, there was a nationally represented sample in Israel um, and they found that although that although um, individuals have been under constant threat for some time, that 75% of people in that community felt like they could handle a terrorist attack if it occurred. So it kind of speaks to the fact that you can have self-efficacy even in the height of, um, of um, tense, um, tense environments. Um, another uh, way that we develop self-efficacy is by watching others, so modeling. Um, we develop self-efficacy by verbal persuasion, so hearing what others tell us, you're doing a good job, things are great, or what we tell ourselves. And then finally, physiological feedback or emotional states, and that kind of goes with what I said before. If we are um, in a chronic state of, um, you know, um, our voice is shaking, I feel tense, my stomach is knotted, and I'm, you know, I'm experiencing emotions of fear, but in a physiological way, that sometimes can hinder our self-efficacy, our ability to feel like we can do things. So um, that's one of the reasons that we promote calming too, is because calming is related to self-efficacy. So self-efficacy and resiliency. Um, so self-efficacy essentially leads to the, the feeling of I can cope with this. And individual intervention to promote self-efficacy can focus on things like reminders of past adversity overcome, we can also recalibrate expectations formed under normal circumstances. So a lot of times people, for instance, um, you know, working with firefighters, it can, you know, if I have a firefighter who feels as though they, um, they you know, they had a strong emotional reaction to something they saw, they might, that might limit their self, they might say, hey, I don't know what's wrong with me, I don't know why I'm crying, I don't know why I'm upset. And so one of the things that we can do is remind them that that's under normal circumstances, that makes a lot of sense, but this is not a normal circumstance. And of course you would be upset given, given that you're in this abnormal circumstance and given everything that's happening. The other thing we can do with self-efficacy is really to teach people how to set achievable goals. So helping establish a sense of environmental control and then help with problem solving um, skills to post-tragedy adversity.
Okay, and, um, and this diagram represents cognitive behavioral therapy in a nutshell. And um, this is uh, something that many mental health providers are trained in and can uh, certainly uh, be one of those interventions at the top of the pyramid. Skills and resources. One of the things I want to mention, it can be very easy to give people a self-handout sheet on coping resources or something they can do. But, um, but sometimes that can backfire, especially when resources are depleted. So you can imagine that if somebody, you know, um, was in a state of poverty and they um, have a psychological history of, you know, severe mental illness or even just past depression or current depression, and then you give them a self-help sheet or a handout on coping resources, it's sort of assuming that if you aren't coping well, that you are doing something wrong. So I always like to just um, remind ourselves that, again, going back to the bottom of that pyramid, that we really need um, to, to, to be careful about providing um, resources that are achievable for people. Um, and, and it also speaks to the need of really building those resources before, um, before we just kind of um, give a quick fix. So um, it's important for public mental health programs to really collaborate with development initiatives so that we understand who in the community has the resources to, to do these types of interventions. And what about collective efficacy? So collective efficacy refers to a community coming together, oftentimes memorials or meetings or collective mourning. Um, and this is a good picture of um, Gabrielle Gifford's office and a memorial that was um, conducted in front. And um, collective efficacy um, is, um, is, is a really nice opportunity to model grief and for um, a community to come together. Um, so, uh, so how do we develop collective efficacy? Well, the key thing is to build on, on available resources. So um, that speaks um, to um, some recommendations from the World Health Organization, which involve um, really needing to assess the strengths of a community and identifying the vulnerability and, and making sure that the support for that community going through it um, comes from individuals within the effective community. So, so local people should really maintain control and decisions over factors in their lives. And, and it speaks to the need for all public health professionals or, and professionals in general in that community to have a good, um, a good hand on cultural competence so they know their members. Um, mental health work is extremely sensitive. It has the potential to create harm um, because it deals with some highly sensitive issues um, like human rights, um, as well as power relationships and differences between outsiders as well as emergency affected people. Um, and so the idea is that the more the community can be involved in facilitating the development of programs, um, we can move away from charity models and really um, help the community to be re-empowered. So um, what does this mean in practical strategy? Well, the World Health Organization, I'm just gonna briefly read through this, but all of this information is publicly available and also in the reference list, but some recommendations to make sure that we have a lot of fidelity to this idea is to have one mental health coordination group, um, because as soon as you have parallel groups, our subgroups, you start to get into other issues. And it's easy to, for people to divide, you know, mental health groups into children or, or um, you know, this diagnosis or that diagnosis, but you, the recommendation is actually to try to have one mental health coordination group um, to make sure you're using validated local assessment tools that are relevant to the population. Also, individuals um, need to have ongoing supervision when they intervene for community health workers. It can be easy um, in mental health land to stray and to go off into um, saying certain things that aren't particularly appropriate or, or just might not follow the fidelity of the evidence-based therapy, search, or not therapy, but, but intervention. So really making sure that there's ongoing supervision. And, and I'll just mention that, that secondary trauma is also another issue, too. Um, making sure that people aren't, um, you know, aren't developing their own um, kind of mental health distress related to some of the stories that they'll be hearing, they could be hearing. Um, we need to, um, other recommendations from the World Health Organization is to make sure that, um, that general health care and psychological are integrated and social, um, really need to protect our um, severe mental illness. Uh, look out for alcohol, and then also making sure there's access to information on, on coping mechanisms. 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> so that's self and collective efficacy. Let's talk about the two remaining essential ingredients. Um, and the next one is social connectedness. And it's interesting because this one, um, what is social connectedness? It is, um, it, it talks about social support and social connectedness is, is, so it's social support, but it's also a way that people can get information um, about the disaster that's essential for a disaster response. And it's interesting because social connectedness actually has more data supporting how important it is, but in some ways it's really hard to know exactly how we can develop interventions to promote this. So what do I mean by data? Well, after a London bombing, one study showed that having a delay in making connections with loved ones increased risk of PTSD substantially. Um, another study showed that, um, that um, immigrants after the Cambodia Pol Pot genocide, they found that, that, that connecting with one family member after immigration significantly reduced risk. So um, it really speaks to how key, and if you remember from the World Health Organization Intervention Pyramid, this is the second one up right after, right after uh, security. And we can promote app connectedness. And like I said, it's hard to know exactly how this translates to intervention. But the, I, the, the current thinking right now is that we really need to find and assist those who lack support. And so that means providing support, but also training them how to access support. We also need to remember that some individuals who lack support um, overuse systems, support systems. So we need to consider this and also address that um, as well as social influence, um, as well as addressing negative social influences. Because sometimes we'll have support, but it's not particularly the type of support that's useful. So ways that we can promote connectedness is um, giving psychoeducation to people on how to identify and recruit support, and then also family intervention as well. Okay, and then in the interest of time, I'll go ahead and move through some of these. So I just want to give an effective, some examples of interventions or some things. And this is a picture of a, cal of a couple um, coming through, the, you know, learning about their house after a, um, a California wildfire. And um, some ideas of ways that other people have done this, um, and this oftentimes is um, we can take the data from refugee camps, um, but we can promote social support networks through welcoming committees. Um, places of worship are very, um, very uh, good um, conduits we can use. Um, having meeting places for, for communities, making sure those safe spaces are there, and then even thinking about entertainment and other cultural ways, like in some um, places having soccer fields where kids go, the parents are there, and that can be a way of promoting social support networks. The other thing I want to mention is peer support. So we're always looking for people who don't have support, but there are actually people out there in the community who, who want to help. And so we need to pay attention to those people because they we can work with them to help them figure out how do I help people and how can I be helpful to others as well. All right, I'm gonna get there. All right, and then the fifth essential ingredient is an installation of hope. And this is a picture of um, President, it's actually of the crowd um, in our U of A auditorium here when President Obama was visiting. And, and you'll see that someone is holding a sign that says we will heal. Um, and I really like that from the perspective of hope. So what is hope? Hope is this feeling, it's a sense of coherence. It's this feeling that um, one's internal and external environments are predictable and that things will work out as can reasonably be expected. So there is, it's a very future oriented um, way that we think about things. And here in you know, the West and the United States, um, middle socioeconomic status, we tend to think of um, it really emphasizes self-agency, like I have hope, I can, if I can do things, I can have it. But I just want to mention that other cultures have see hope in different ways. Um, that could be religious or even through the government or um, superstition. But um, one of the things that we know that is an installation of hope is, um, is assistance. So for combat veterans, um, one of the things that we see as a primary predictor of hope is employment when they return stateside. And then we've We've seen the alternative in cases like New Orleans, for instance, people felt like they had no need to evacuate because they would have no resources to evacuate anyway. Um, and then the same thing with Hurricane Andrew, we saw that one of the primary predictors of PTSD is a lack of funds for rebuilding. So advocacy programs can absolutely promote self-efficacy and that can help instill hope. 
Now, what, what does this assistance look like when we think about that? Well, there's assistance at an individual level, and that, that means um, that we need to identify those that, need, that have a need. Um, and I, I'm going to use the example, maybe they want to like complete, they need it to complete an insurance form. And the way we can assist is we want to clarify the need, come up with an action plan, give information on what to expect, you know, what's the application procedures, what's the qualification criteria, and then they can act to address the need. So it's very much a, you know, I'm just kind of just breaking down the problem solving process. But that types of assistance is, you know, when, when you have so many things coming at you after your life has been shattered, that type of like take off a small piece and go through it can be extremely helpful on an individual level. <clears throat> One of the things I just want to mention, <clears throat> and when we talk about the installation of help, is um, listening for self-blame. Um, so self-blame actually degrades hope. It makes it hard for people to look ahead. So an example of self-blame um, is, you know, like if somebody, um, I should have left earlier, I should have evacuated earlier. So, so when we hear things like that, um, um, we can increase hope by trying to, you know, it's really easy to be like, well, you shouldn't blame yourself. And, and a lot of times people will be like, yeah, but I, but I still do. An alternative is to kind of remind people um, of the context within which they made their decision. You know, and, um, trauma happens quickly. It happens under stress and pressure. So one of the things that I do in my practice anyway is we talk about I did the best I can give it, I, you know, I could given information I had, the decision I made, and the elements within my control. And I, and I always remind people that strong emotional reactions are not in our control, and that has to do with that fight or flight response. Um, I think I mentioned this earlier, explicitly educating that most people recover spontaneously after trauma is a way of, of you know, producing hope. Um, and then helping people do things that are active rather than passive waiting. Um, so that can be very hope oriented as well. Okay, I just want to talk about benefit real briefly because I know we're getting near the end for our question and answer session. Um, it can be really easy to want to help people find meaning, but actually this is one of those things that we encourage people to sit back and wait on, um, wait for people who are ready. But when you see it, it's a great thing to be like, that's really cool. So an example of here's a, um, uh, a note pasted to Gabby Gifford's um, memorial, and you'll see it says, your commitment to democracy came with a heavy cost. Thank you for your sacrifice for us. So talking about meaning and all of it. All right, um, community intervention in terms of, of, of hope. Um, just saying, so we talked about the individual level intervention, what about the community level? Um, and so the key thing is that media, schools, community leaders can focus on making sure there's an accurate risk assessment, positive goals, really building strengths in communities, helping people tell their stories, and then clean up, rebuilding, and home visits. And you can see this is a picture here from California and the, the recent wildfires and UC United Way workers. And I just think that um, really speaks to how we can promote hope within the community as well. So in summary, how does all this translate to practice for early intervention with trauma survivors? Well, on an individual level, really remembering our key elements of normalization, support, highlighting self-efficacy and people's strengths. Remember that calming is great. Um, bereavement, training skills, and always within bereavement, remembering cultural and religious considerations, encouraging pleasant activities, daily routines, self-efficacy, fostering social support, and then reframing, and, and obviously cognitive behavioral therapy can be some, a really great option for individuals as they reach that top of that pyramid for mental health professionals to administer. And then on a community level, remembering we can provide safe locations, providing an organized voice, um, and really thinking about the media and uh, you know, using media for safety perceptions um, and for information versus and limiting uh, media that involves threat perception. Um, providing information, psychoeducation, and resources, fostering community activities, um, including some of those memorials we talked about that promote collective efficacy, collaborating with the development of programs, so collaborating mental health-wise in terms of pr programs that are designed to provide those basic services, helping link, um, link people with loved ones, and then developing advocacy programs. All right, I think that that is it. Thanks for your attention. I know we've had
time for a few questions? Yeah, we do. And first I wanna address all the people that are asking about um, getting the slides. Do you have any objection to us posting a PDF of these slides? Yeah, no problem. Okay, so when this is made available on our website, there will also be an attachment you can download that will have these slides as a PDF that you can print out. Um, the first question is two parts, but do you have any examples of types of community programs that can be developed either before mass trauma occurs or after traumatic events using the five essential elements? So things like hotlines, PSAs, et cetera. Right, right. Well, I think it depends strongly on the community and what actually occurred, right? So, um, so I, I like the idea of hotlines, but to a certain extent, it's a really big question of whether the community would actually use the hotline or not. So I give an example, which is probably not super relevant for the United States, but after the tsunami happened in Thailand, one of the mass community interventions was the community came together and rebuilt um, uh, fishing ships together. And that rebuilding actually was a highly effective intervention and it was one of the, the things that really promoted the community as a whole. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's so easy to wanna come in and just jump in and address mental health specifically, but in the short term aftermath, and within the first couple of months, some of the best things the community can do for mental health is actually rebuilding resources. So if we think about loss of homes and we think about loss of maybe community structures, rebuilding those structures together and thinking about how to do that could actually be very beneficial for the mental health. Okay. And in terms of before mass trauma occurs, are there measures, preventative measures that public health can take to promote resiliency before those events? I mean, absolutely. And there's a whole body of literature out there that we didn't even broach today on preparedness and all the different things we can do to ensure that your family is prepared for emergency response. And then also the community is prepared for emergency response. And a lot of that means that community le leaders need to come together and come up with a preparedness plan for when things occur so that we know how things will happen. Um, and a lot of the CDC provides a lot of those, a lot of those resources. Okay, and we also have a question on how can the public health workforce work with media to minimize how media exacerbates unhealthy post-event emotions? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, it's, I, my experience is that um, working with media is actually, they're always looking for different angles, you know, and I, and I think that, you know, um, a lot of, you know, I mean, we don't want to violate patient's privacy or confidentiality, but there's a lot of really great stories out there of resiliency. So I think, and, and one of those ideas is, um, you know, we talked about telling stories. Mm -hmm. So we hear about all the stories of loss and sadness, but stories of loss and sadness and how people overcome those and resilient can be very powerful and potent. Along with, you know, hey, public health department or public health you know, is releasing this set of recommendations. You know, that's news in and of itself. And here's some things you can, it's be common to not sleep in the short term aftermath. And here's some things you can consider doing if you need to sleep. So I think that really thinking about media as almost a resource mm -hmm. um, can be extremely helpful. Okay. Um, one more question. Huh? Um, after a traumatic event, individuals go through different reactions. But when should the individual that experienced trauma be concerned about their mental health or possibly seek counseling or other resources? Right. So, um, I mean, you know, all of it's on the spectrum. And I'm just going to say that, um, that you know, technically we can't diagnose anybody with post-traumatic stress disorder until 30 days afterwards. But there's actually even, you know, some people have very strong acute stress reactions. So I would say if your reactions are interfering with an ability to function or do your job or, or communicate or do work, if, if they're significantly impairing your life, it's never, you, it's a great time to go and reach out to a mental health professional for sure, um, regardless of time frame. But typically we expect symptoms to go, go down over time, you know, so, you know, even three or four months later, we still expect symptoms to be there and then to go down, you know, six, seven months later. Um, but if they're impairing your ability to function or be close to your family, then that's a time to seek help. Okay. Or causing a tremendous amount of distress. 
Okay, it looks like we have another question about how does the approach to all of this differ between children and adults? Right. Um, so, yeah, a lot of this was about, and I'm not sure exactly what we mean to all of this, um, because on a community level, that, of course, involves children. Mm -hmm. And then on an individual level, um, you know, children just have so many different emotional reactions, so it can be really normal for a child to hear about bad news and then, like, feel like fine with it and run away, or to pretend they didn't hear the bad news and, um, and uh, just pretend, you know, that didn't actually happen. You know, and then teenagers can get, uh, it, you know, there can be more of a um, angry reaction or angry response from that self-blame. So I think that thinking about reactions by kids and how they're different is the key. And then really making sure that we, um, that, you know, that as a community, we find those resources for children. We don't ever leave, like, children alone in, in um, these types of uh, settings. All right. Thank you. And I do want to go to show for those of you that are getting CNEs for this, you will have to go to cne.nursing.arizona.edu to fill out an evaluation form to get those CNE credits. And for everyone else, if you could go to the SurveyMonkey link here, um, that will help us get feedback, give us ideas for what we should do our next webinar on. And you'll also need to go here if you're trying to get Chez credits. Is there a question? Sure. And I can put this in the chat box, but I think we automatically go here at the end. When we close this webinar, I think it will automatically take you to this link. But just in case, I'm gonna type it in here. All right, so thank you everyone for coming today. Thanks. And if there are any other questions or responses or feedback, you can also email me um, my email should be on the flyer that was sent out, but I'll include it here as well. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thank you.